President Garza's uh, anecdote about um, the paper with one sentence reminds me of uh, an assignment I actually was given uh, when I was in uh, upper elementary school, and it was an assignment to write a three-page story in one sentence. But it had to be syntactically correct. <laughs> That's the difference. It had to actually be a, a full grammatical sentence, not a strung together sentence. Um, but anyway, thank you uh, so much. I'm thrilled to be here, um, not just at Mountain View, but at this important conference. Um, I think it offers us a great opportunity to talk um, with and learn from each other about how we can improve student achievement, retention, uh, completion, and success, uh, and also transitions to the work the workforce, the workplace. Um, so thank you, and also I want to especially thank uh, Professor Jeff Grimes and Vice President Dottie for inviting me and uh, seeing to those arrangements. You're going to hear a lot about the relationship between writing and work um, and the skills required in the workplace at this conference. Uh, it's a theme of Mountain View's QDP, and I can tell you that over the almost 40 years of my experience uh, as a person in, in the field of writing studies, um, this has been a constant refrain. It's never died down. When we talk to people in business and industry, we hear this again and again, they want strong communicators. Sometimes they want strong communicators more than anything else. They want people who can speak effectively, who can write effectively, and who have skills of teamwork, because so many people work in teams. Um, so that's never abated, and there are many studies of businesses and corporations that show that strong writing and communication skills are highly, highly desired, and there's a clear pathway to advancement for those who possess those skills. You can go into any company and you can ask people who are your strong communicators, and they'll point at them. They'll say those are the, and they're often the folks who are advancing the most quickly. Um, I'm going to leave those arguments and their support for others who you'll hear from today. Instead, I want to focus on academia. I want to focus on what happens in the classroom. Uh, students enroll in higher education courses, no matter what schools, with what emphases, no matter what level, no matter what their career goals, it's important for them to develop the skills of, uh, and abilities to write. And because if we're to meet the needs of the 21st century job, our own job starts in the classroom and in campus support services. Um, and, we, and because we know that writing, and we know from a lot of research that writing is highly developmental, and it's just not something you get once. There's a sort of a mythology about that. Why didn't they get this in high school? You don't get it once. It keeps developing over the span of your entire career. Um, so my focus is going to be at the course level, and even more specifically on principles of assignment design that we can use to um, create really, really meaningful assignments um, Dr. Grimes calls those consequential assignments we'll hear from him later today. So let's get to work. Um, this is a writing assignment from a biology course. Describe how the immune system responds to the introduction of a gram-positive bacteria. Maybe with a little admonition. <laughs> it seems like a pretty standard assignment um, that you might see. And it might require a couple of pages of careful description. So, uh, I'm not a biologist, and my own biology courses are kind of a distant memory. Um, so I took a shot at responding to this. And I started my response by finding what I needed on the first page of links that I went to on, online, the Google search. And then I kind of just rearranged some of the text uh, and rewrote it a little bit, kind of patch wrote it. So while the start of that response you know, might look okay, to biologists, I don't have a clue what's going on <laughs> in the processes, right? I just don't know. Have I learned anything about gram-positive bacteria in the immune system? No, I have not. Um, maybe I didn't pay much attention to lectures. Maybe I didn't really read the chapters carefully. Uh, but I'm able to respond to that writing assignment you know, in a way that looks like it reflects a certain degree of learning when it really doesn't. And the problem here is that the assignment really doesn't, it just it lacks any apparent principles of design. It's a simple test of knowledge without attention to whether students really 
you know, need to know the material without, without thinking about what this, what's happening in the students' heads. Uh, and what else could engage them thoughtfully in the task and in the process of that learning? What might guarantee that learning? Um, so we've seen really significant innovations in you know, the, the so-called delivery mode of higher education. Um, a, lot, a lot more learner-centered approaches, active problem-based learning. We have a project at NC State um, which is called Scale Up. It stands for Student-Centered Active Learning Environment with Upside-Down Pedagogies. Uh, it's all about making students active. The rooms that they go into, they work collaboratively at tables. They do lots and lots of science work with very little lecture. Uh, the research is showing that they're learning far more effectively this way than being told stuff. Um, flipped classes, experiential education, service learning, mentor-based undergraduate research, and, and so on. Uh, so we are, we are making a lot of progress. We've also made big strides in our effort to promote support writing in you know, all disciplinary areas and beyond. It used to be that this was the province of English departments and, and writing courses. We, we know that can't happen. We know it has to be distributed across the entire curriculum and everybody's got to do a part. Um, and, we've, and we've seen that in the sustained focus on writing here at Blue Network Mountain View. We also know from a lot of research that writing, as I said, is highly developmental. It doesn't get learned once in first year composition. It gets much more sophisticated and kind of genre specific, uh, as President Garza suggested in his own trajectory. The way it changes as you move up and, and into the workforce from school. Uh, and you have to help students to practice those thinking processes that are underneath what's required. Um, and, and the only people who do that are people in the actual disciplines themselves. So those are some, some of the central assumptions that inform writing across the curriculum and writing in the disciplines, those programs. But the thoughtful integration of writing into all courses is, is not much further along, unfortunately, um, in widespread implementation than the teaching innovations that I mentioned. We still see a lot of signs that writing assignments are, you know, they continue to be designed as the equivalent of a test. So why, why is that writing assignment in there? Well, I need to have some way of engaging with it, learn something, so it becomes a test rather than a tool for learning. So how do we know this? Well, there's a recently published study of writing assignments across the curriculum. Uh, Dan Meltzer, he collected and analyzed 2,101 assignments. I don't know why there's the 101st assignment in there. 2,101 assignments from a range of undergraduate courses in three kind of generalized disciplinary um, areas. And uh, at 100 colleges and universities across the US. And what he did was his analysis focused on what the assignments were trying to do. What were their kind of rhetorical features? Uh, what sort of audiences could they invoke or ask students to write to? Kind of genres or types of writing that they involve? Um, did they ask students to reflect on something or argue a point or analyze a phenomenon and so on? And his analysis was based on some early work by uh, a guy named James Britton and his colleagues uh, at the University of London. And they established some what are now pretty well known kind of theoretical categories of writing. Transactional, which refers to writing that's addressed to audiences, to specific readers, including teachers. Uh, and it's designed to kind of carry out some reader-related thing, some action, arguing, supporting a point of view, and so on. Expressive writing is often much more personal and directed more to the self. It includes writing that's designed to reflect on or record an experience or learning. In Britain's words, it's a form of discourse that encourages us to take risks, try out ideas that we're not sure of, in contrast to formal kinds of writing where you're supposed to know everything when you do formal writing. You already learn. It's the outcome of learning. And expressive writing is often a way into learning. You're not, you haven't finished learning, and so it's a way of exploring and trying to deal with, grapple with those complex issues. Poetic writing is writing that could be both outer and inner directed, but it involves using the language more creatively and playfully, exploring the actual medium of writing. Um, 
sometimes for its own sake. And there's obviously some blurring of the categories. You know, I, I put blogs in there. Um, they can share kind of some expressive uh, and transactional features. But Meltzer wanted to see if those classifications would work for the assignments that he collected. Because Britton and his colleagues found in their research many years ago that in student school based <coughs> writing, those expressive and poetic forms gradually disappeared uh, as, as kids went up to school. And so we're talking K-12. Uh, their writing became more and more transactional, addressing an audience of one, which was the teacher, who played the role of an examiner. So it systematically stripped away some of these other rich possibilities for writing um, in, in an effort to, uh, to work, you know, to, to focus on writing more of the test. So he subdivided transactional into informative and persuasive, and then he included an additional category that you'll see here, uh, exploratory, that captures assignments to where students might be reflecting, but also in a kind of quasi-conversational way, maybe to a group forum, because we now have all, all these internet enablements, right? And he divided the teacher's audience into examiner and instructor roles because the, the, that category is a little too singular. The instructor category reflects assignments that might involve some feedback from the instructor, maybe on a draft, but still have no other audience. And I think the other categories here are pretty self-explanatory. So the results showed that, that of, of all these assignments that he examined, transactional writing dominates 83% uh, of the assignments, with informative making up the majority of the followed by persuasive. And the other, other language forms see here are, are pretty underrepresented. Expressive and exploratory book writing together don't even reach 20% of the sample. There was almost no poetic use of language, no, you know, no opportunity to sort of play <coughs> with language. So what we see is that college writing is highly limited in its functions. <coughs> and the audience analysis is, is I think, just a start. Um, Look at this chart here. Most of the assignments were designed to be written for an audience of one. A teacher who plays the role of an examiner or instructor. Very few assignments ask students to write for specific other audiences. I mean, you think about students moving out of school and the, and the kind of audiences that they need to consider beyond the instructional context. Um, they're extremely complex and, and varied and multifaceted. We see this every day. We see the problems people face when they don't think about their audiences. And they, and they mess up in a, in a nationally embarrassing way, right? Because they haven't anticipated different kinds of people with different reactions. Uh, so we don't see uh, general readers, imagined readers, the self. Um, in higher education, we're tightly constraining the writing, considering that huge range that writing occupies across the kind of vast landscape. So, of communication. So I want to back up a bit. I want to describe the orientation of writing that I think explains what we see in Meltzer's study. And we can call that a kind of traditional or um, inherited orientation of writing, sometimes called an autonomous orientation that has these kinds of features. The writer is seen as a solitary author. The writing is sort of a test of what's been learned which is maybe why the solitary is so important. You know, it's about cheating, so you want each person to write their own text. Uh, the writing is limited to a set of typical classroom genres. Those are the default values. We go, oh, we're gonna have them do a summary. Oh, we're gonna have them do these, these typical kinds of academic things. In high school, that's the five paragraph theme. It actually spills over into college a lot. The infamous five paragraph theme, the theme which you can't find anywhere in the natural world. It doesn't exist, right? Uh, and the writing exists in a kind of parallel universe outside the classroom. And it's conveyed to a teacher who then represents the sole audience who has the usually unpleasant job um, of evaluating the writing and, and, and its contents. And so I think often unconsciously that model tends to strip away um, considerations of design because we can just crank them out. You know, the same kind of assignments that we've seen or used in the past and you know, not have to think much about it spend that energy on them. Um, scholars of writing have theorized what's sometimes called a, a social practices or ecological view of writing. 
that offers us, I think, a different orientation and maybe more educationally exciting orientation. So here, writing is understood in terms of its role in different communities of practice. <clears throat> so that every form, every function, every type or genre of writing, each use is defined by specific goals within the community and it takes on value within it. Um, so that means that a post to Reddit um, is no more or less worthy than a brief school essay or an amicus brief in a, in a court of law is no more or less, less worthy than an instruction manual um, or maybe a journalistic style blog. They have different consequences, they have different purposes, they have different needs and audiences. And if you wonder about the consequences of those forms of writing, at first it may seem like, well, an amicus brief or a Supreme Court uh, case has got to be you know, more important than a tweet. <coughs> because, because if it, it's influential, then that decision in the Supreme Court is going to be profoundly important <coughs> to the country and to the future. Well, we've seen some tweets that have <laughs> serious consequences, right? We've seen that a tweet can do things nationally or internationally in the same way that an amicus brief, brief might. So we can't, we can't assign value in that way to these different forms of writing uh, because they can have very different consequences. A novel can be really bad um, and maybe something else that's not a novel can be better in terms of its value than a really bad novel uh, or an editorial in the New York Times. So that's not really a good, a good index. Interestingly, um, the form of the writing can also mask what's going on beneath it. And here's where I want to come around to the notion of design. There's a kind of deep structure of activity that becomes invisible because the form masks it. So, for example, a 14-year-old making a point about a quarterback on, on his favorite team, uh, the fan form for his favorite team, is marshalling evidence and using persuasive strategies of exactly the kind we want to teach. And I've studied these. I've done a couple of projects where I've looked at the writing that people do in social media, especially when they're writing to forums like Reddit, or fan forums, and things like that. Um, and what's going on there, we might say, well, that's just junk. It's not school. But what's going on is very often those kids are held to very high standards of evidence and argument by the community. You don't have the right stats. If you're making a point about wanting to get rid of a quarterback, you're going to get trashed by that community unless you've actually done the homework. So those kids are doing this outside of school, and it's quite interesting to look at um, that kind of uh, the ecological orientation, as Wardle and Musen say, recognizes and acts from the assumption that the breadth of students' literate experiences in and out of school impacts their ability to do academic literacy tasks. <clears throat> Okay, so there are some things in the ecology, you know, a bee is just as important as an elephant, but there are some things that are just noxious, and, you know, like kudzu and the zebra mussels and the invasive species and stuff. And there are the same in discourse, right? Claiming, name calling, kind of basic stuff that we see sometimes. So I give you that. Um, that's, another, that's another issue to talk about, um, which we're not going to deal with today, but I think it's also part of what we're trying to achieve is that how to be responsible. In any kind of writing that they're doing. <coughs> but, <coughs> but this view changes our orientation toward writing. So writers are seen part, as parts of multiple communities of practice, <coughs> including the one in the classroom, or the ones. Writing isn't always a test, but it can be a way into learning. A course isn't limited to conventional school genres, but allows infinite variations. The writing becomes part of the class sessions and the teacher can be more than just an examiner. <clears throat> so how does that model affect design? Well, in a couple ways. Um, first of all, the kind of intellectual activity that the assignment requires is really important uh, when we start to unpack it, and the way that it might be woven into the fabric of the actual course, the class. Thinking about both of those things is really essential to creating a good, a good writing assignment. And, they, and together, they can be understood as what I like to call the structure of activity beneath the assignment. So it's really helpful for us to say, not just here's an assignment, but what's the structure of activity? What are people actually doing when they respond? Um, what are the intellectual and cognitive 
activities um, and how are those linked to learning and then how might we use those in a more socially dynamic way. I want to consider each of these in turn. Let's go back to the immunology assignment. <clears throat> this is an assignment by Colin Martin, who's a professor of biology at uh, the University of St. Thomas, where I've been visiting for a week and right after New Year's uh, Day and in the middle of June, in fact, I'm going there this, this coming Sunday, um, for the last 11 years to work with a new set of about 25 faculty. Uh, they're gonna just try to cover their whole faculty. And, and so this is Colin Martin, uh, who's there. And look at the assignment. You are a gram-positive bacterium that has infected a human being and somehow managed to bring along a very small lab. <laughs> write one or more blog posts in the voice of this bacterium that describe what is happening in the local area from the point of entry to the body until the infection is resolved. <clears throat> write about the experience of being under attack by the immune system. Report on what's happening to you. Your blog posts can be structured however you wish, but they must include depictions of encounters with these things. This is a very clever assignment. <coughs> this is a sign an assignment where <clears throat> the students cannot avoid knowing the processes as opposed to the one that we started with. So it's, uh, what's interesting is it's allowed in the discourse of blogging, which comes from the ecological environment and social media, and does interesting things you know, to the way that the information might be presented. But instead of cheapening the responses, or weakening the rigor of the assignment it compels students to understand those processes in order to render them as a kind of voyage, a narrative of experience. Now the audience broadens to imagine bloggers and readers of the blogs. The context becomes a living human. The, pers the persona of the self of the writer becomes a bacterium. We go back to Meltzer's results. The conventional orientation explains, and we can see how that assignment um, moves beyond the tired old academic description as test. And the structure of activity beneath it uh, requires reading, studying, understanding the terminology, rendering it in presumably experiential language of the journey and the chronological version of blogging. This is also his little <coughs> uh, rubric, it's kind of a mid stakes assignment. And what's curious here is what's in red. Um, this is a biology teacher who never, I think you can see that, it's maybe a little, little bit small, but he's also, and there's nothing wrong with this, he's also trying to instill in students a sense of creativity and play. So he's actually looking for that. He's looking for blog entries that are lively and imaginative and interesting. Why can't we do that in all of our courses and actually expect a little bit of that? Um, and he's going to evaluate for it in STEM content. So these together can be understood as the underlying structure of activity. Imagine a case to be through the journey and so on. Give you a couple more examples. This is from uh, a community college with both a transfer program and a certificate program. And in this assignment we see, I think, a creative use of context that compels students to uh, explain and understand some basic concepts they're learning. And you know, it's not that hard to assign another audience than the teacher. We're scheduled to meet with members of the local scout troop who are comp completing merit badges, write out an introduction to alternate current, direct current, distinguish between them, you know, for kids to understand, help them understand that. This is not something you can go to Wikipedia and find because you have to translate it into, into language that kids will understand. So sometimes playing with the audience, taking it away from the teacher and saying, here's somebody who doesn't know anything, explain this to them. It's not much of a, of a tweak, but it has profound consequences for how students can respond. Uh, by the way, these kinds of assignments, once we start playing with that structure of activity and developing more case-based and, and engaging assignments, really hard to plagiarize. Really, if you want to, if you want to get rid of plagiarism in your courses, get rid of the, the, the same old, same old kind of assignments where students can just go find the answer somewhere and, and reproduce it and build in context audiences, change, change up, change the game, uh, and then students will have to, will have to write uh, in ways where they can't find the information. 
This is an assignment from uh, Professor Michael Blackman's history course in Early American Global Perspectives. It's 1682, you're a grumpy, lapsed, rebellious teenage Puritan in your master's bay colony. Your parents dragged you across the ocean from England to a religious experiment in the world. You hate everything. You don't feel particularly devout. You're not sure you want to be a Puritan anymore. You're considering running away, maybe to Rhode Island, the cesspool of New England, where all the Quakers <laughs> seem to go, or maybe even to join an Indian village somewhere. On one particularly petulant Saturday, you skip your Bible study and sheep shearing and spend the afternoon reading a brand new book, Mary Rowlandson's account of her time as an Indian captive in the Civil War. It's a really interesting narrative. Uh, it's a it's captivity narrative. Um, write your response to Rowlandson's narrative. And here, so what he's done is he's set up um, this rebellious spirit in the, in the writer. He's assigned a sort of perspective to the, to the students to take on, and they have to then write about this Rollinson's narrative, and in a sense, they've become skeptics. He's assigned them a kind of skepticism. And she's doing some really interesting things relating her, in, her captivity experience to her faith, to her Puritan faith. And there's some issues there. You can see it. She's proselytizing a little bit and stuff. So you're going to get students to critically analyze this at a different level than you would by just saying, summarize Mary Rollinson's narrative. This is really quite interesting. Here's another one. This is a situated scenario from nursing. A patient will undergo an ultrasound as part of a routine pregnancy examination, but she comes from a rural community and has very little experience with new technologies in clinical or hospital environments. And she's worried about ultrasound. Is it going to harm my baby? Write a letter to this patient, give her an imaginary name, explain the nature of the ultrasound technology, how it works, what she will experience when she comes in to be examined cover the main points from our readings. You can see what's happening here. It's just changing up the audience a little bit, providing a, a real world purpose. If you want to relate that to the world of work, maybe they're going to be doing something like this. And this is bringing that into the classroom in, in an engaging and imaginative way. This is a course in Latin American history. Imagine that you were present at a meeting where Cortez and Montezuma sat down and discussed what each thought of the other civilization, what do you think they would have said? Write a dialogue between the two men discussing what they admire and dislike. Again, no plagiarism possible here. You, know, you can't find this. You can't go look, I challenge you to look up dialogue between these two men. <laughs> and so again, and dialogues are great. I use those all the time because students don't have a hard time with the form itself. If you want to get to the content, it's easy for them to write dialogue. But they've got to know what they're writing about. They can't. They, has to go somewhere, so they've got to read and study the perspectives. They can't just go, hey, Cortez, what'd you have for lunch today? I mean, this doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so there are many, many of these design options, all sorts of possibilities. We give ourselves permission to create really engaging goal-based assignments. These are among the hundreds of learning-based assignments that take us beyond the kind of stale and dull inherited things that we assign to students and into lively, I think, but really still intellectually challenging ways of confronting and interpreting and, and uh, conveying course material. Uh, if, if you want to know about fake book entries, go look at go look up fake book. It's a, it's a replica of Facebook designed for school. And if you like students to do analyses you know, of, of people, uh, there are all kinds of examples. They create a, face, a Facebook profile and they add friends and they begin to do conversations between like Darwin and Darwin's is other people that Darwin's been around with. Uh, and students love it because they can use the language of social media as they make posts, but they have to know what they actually said in order to carry it on. One more little bit of research, because um, I want to get to the social part. We. We did a study some years ago uh, using the National Survey of Student Engagement, a famous Nessie survey. We convinced those folks at Nessie to add 27 questions that we developed um, in over a, a year and a half of consultation with experts in writing, and refined and tested those. And we ended up with three subscales of those questions. Meaning making writing tasks, that's what I've been talking about. Clear expectations for writing assignments, which is when you provide students criteria or here's what I'm here just clearly what we're looking for and then interactive writing processes um, and so we had 50,000 plus surveys 
and th those the answers clustered into those three sub subscales. And here's what we we found: um, the, the interactive writing processes involve talking with or getting feedback from an instructor, peers, classmates. In other words, the writing becomes useful and functional in the classroom and involves other people. Those, each of those three writing scales was positively related to three deep learning scales that are already part of the Nessie results. Higher order learning, integrative learning, and reflective learning. Higher order learning is how much students say their coursework emphasizes analyzing experiences and theories, synthesizing concepts, into more complex relationships, making judgments about the value of information. Integrated learning is about combining ideas from different sources, maybe different perspectives from different coursework. Uh, reflective learning focuses on students' self-examination of their views on a topic, uh, understanding the perspectives of others. It turns out that when you engage students in peer review of their writing, um, that scale in, in Proves. The more of that they do, the more tolerant they become of, of other people's views. Wow, we need more of that. We need students to be understanding of one another, um, one another's perspectives. Um, and you can read a short version in, in that was published in peer review of this study. So that's another important dimension of the structure of activity, which is what happens in the social fabric of the classroom and how it's used. Um, and if you don't use them, then you miss some opportunities to foster more interactive and social learning. But what you typically do is there's that one-to-one -one thing that students write alone, they turn it in, they grade it, turn it back, and there's no use of that, of that text. Uh, so in the immunology assignment, one possibility would be to make it episodic and the students post their blog entries to the course website and everybody reads each other as they go along. So when we revise that orientation, we see the social and interactive implications. The assignments are designed to be woven into the social fabric of the course. Students frequently share their work. They interact through writing. It becomes part of the coverage of material. So early America responses. Students will know they may be chosen to present their teenage lives during the interpretation of the Rollinson narrative. Uh, and there's a great, so, uh, if you haven't seen this, go to class tools, and there's a great, um, kind of a slot machine thing and you put the students' names in and you press this button and it just turns and turns and then slows agonizingly down. You see the students' names on the slot machine and it slows agonizingly down until finally there's one student that it observes in on and there's cheering. And that student then gets to present. It's, it's a great tool because you've only got 10 minutes. You can choose as many as you need. There's no egomaniacal students. Um, it's completely random. And so people have to be prepared when they come in uh, to the class. So that's another way to do that, uh, to bring this into the classroom. The electricity assignments, students play the role of scouts in the assignment scenario. A random student selector chooses to provide his or her explanation. And instead of sharing the Q&A part, they actually engage in a Q&A and the class uh, plays the role of scouts, naive scouts, asking sometimes silly questions, but maybe ones that weren't, that weren't anticipated. Latin American history, after the students have written the assignment, they form pairs to carry on dialogues in the persona uh, of Montezuma or Cortez, and, and so on. So you can see how, how these things work. This isn't really rocket science. It's just taking the results of what students are doing and maximizing their potential in the class. So a couple of puzzles. Um, what about the need to teach those, those discipline-based academic professional types of writing, uh, and what about specific work-related documents? Well, if we think about learning goals first, then the goals help us choose, make design choices, and that lead to an assignment. So everything begins and ends with goals. So let's say you've got a goal to learn to do an effective business memo. And your design choice then is teach the form explicitly. Here's what a business memo looks like. Maybe the content's not important at this point. Write a business memo following the correct format. That's one option. So that's just form. Uh, what about content? Well, if the goal is uh, we want students to learn the principles of effective business management, 
then the design choice could be to teach that content explicitly, and the form is not, important, not as important. This is where you see these, these variations. You know, like, well, I ran into a teacher, uh, a STEM teacher at UMBC in Baltimore. Everybody's heard of UMBC now, right, because of the NCAA. My son's a professor of political science there. <laughs> But because they, because they won in that first game, and if you had been in Las Vegas, in those rooms where all the TVs are there and they've got sports on and you're betting on them, if you had bet $10, you would have made half a million dollars on that game. Oh I'm not kidding. <laughs> but everybody knows what UMBC is now, right? I ran into a teacher there who has her students summarize peer-reviewed journal articles in the form of a tweet. And back then, it was when I encountered her, it was 147 characters. That's really, turned out that that's really hard to do. Um, so the, in that case, the form is, you know, the form is being used as a way to get to the content. And the assignment, let's say, is write a, an obituary of a business that failed, something like this. Well, who's gonna write an obituary in their, in their work, you know, if they're gonna go into a business? Probably not very often, or maybe never. Doesn't matter if, the con if you're using the form to get at the content. So that's a design choice. Maybe the form doesn't matter at this point and you really want to focus on the content. What about if you want to do both? <clears throat> Goal is learn principles of effective business management and memo writing. And in this case, the design choice is teach the content and the form together and the assignment is write a business memo to upper management describing why a business failed and what, it, what the implications are for, for them. Right? So you can do both at the same time. But it's, but it's consciously thinking about the relationship between what you want them to learn and the content and what kind of form you're going to use. I like playing with form. I think it's great to do dialogues and do little scenarios and change up the author. Um, and so that leads me to this question about vocationalism because I think we have a tendency to want to, to, want to teach directly to the vocations that students are going into. So we're going to narrow down those types of writing to the ones that are the most relevant. To their, to their future or even present work. Um, and there's been some really interesting work on different kinds of learners. Um, there are unidirectional learners. They tend not to transfer knowledge across context. They, they put everything on, in a box under the bed that's not related to what their, what their goals and aspirations are. And they're omnidirectional learners who are constantly looking at the relationship between different kinds of knowledge. They don't put stuff under the bed, they keep it out. They can say, oh, I'm going to use that to understand this in this other setting. <clears throat> Those tend to be good learners. They tend to transfer their knowledge more effectively. So there, that leads to a principle, it seems to me, that um, it's OK to, to change it up. It's OK even in a course that seems to have a, a pretty straight trajectory into a particular workplace to be creative, to be imaginative, to use different kinds of genres and contexts. Because we know that writers get better when they have more of those kinds of experiences. You know, if you want to, you want to teach a, a police, future police officer to do incident reports, and that's the only writing they're ever going to do is incident reports. They're not getting the wealth of experience that make will make them a strong writer in all kinds of other settings. Um, so there's a focus on engagement by both teachers and students. It involves community. There's a willingness to kind of get rid of your move off the st center stage and anticipate the unexpected. Um, this comes from a document uh, which is called the Framework for Success in Post-Secondary Writing. It was produced by the Council of Writing Program Administrators, the NCTD National Council of Teachers of English, and the National Writing Project. And look at, you know, these are all writing outcomes. Uh, but look at how raw they are. Curiosity, openness, engagement, creativity, persistence, responsibility, flexibility, and recognition. These are really, really important things for students to leave here, leave here at any, any university or college campus with. This is really what we're trying to teach them. And I want to ask the question, to what extent are we doing that as well as teachers? To what extent are we providing opportunities to be curious, to be open, to be engaged? Right? And that's where I want to make that case for, for diversifying assignments. So in terms of learning those formal academic genres, uh, design principles are at least as important. Choosing areas of focus, modes of presentation, that can play an important role, and support for writing is really essential. When you go formal and higher stakes, the support is crucial. And we tend to do one and done. 
know what happens when you do a one and done, right? It looks terrible because the students have sometimes done it at the last minute and it hasn't revised and hasn't reread. So if you support the iterative process of writing over time, those, whatever they're writing is going to get better. What does that mean? It means work on processes required in the assignment. It means discussing the context, unpacking that structure of activity, providing opportunities for students to revise. Because they think that the better you get as a writer, the less you have to revise. It's just completely backwards. You know, good writers are constantly revising. Um, and especially through the use of peer review, which can be really, really useful when done well. And offer formative response when possible. Um, provide really good summative response uh, when that's required as well. So I'm going to wrap up here, but one other puzzle is what about all the time it takes for this kind of design stuff, right? And that integration to the classroom, doesn't that eat up the time that you would otherwise use for other things? A teacher of art history once said, when I was suggesting using peer review uh, about the role of coverage in his course, he said that if you spent one class period having students do things with their writing in this big sweeping art history course, you would lose half the 19th century in coverage. Because what he's doing is he's showing a whole bunch of slides of paintings and stuff like that and, and talking to the students. Well, he's probably losing half or at least a quarter of the 19th century using that delivery mode. It's going to go in and out, right? Um, and so, but it's easy to see why that's a concern because writing then becomes an intrusion. It gets in the way of covering the material. Uh, there's, a, there's an easy solution, you know, even if you're skeptical about flipping whole classes, flip that one class. And that's what I do is I throw a video up online. The students have to watch the video. I have a low stakes writing assignment to make sure they did watch it. And then I bought myself a whole class period in, in, a, in a bricks and mortar class for them to interact on their writing. So I think there are easy solutions to that time. Uh, I'm going to skip that. There are a couple of helpful resources about assignment design principles. There's a new journal called Prompt. Hundreds and hundreds of really awesome assignments. And then there's something called the Meaningful Writing Project, which I think overlaps in important ways with um, Dr. Grimes' consequential writing, where he's saying, we're going to look at different kinds of forms of writing and see how we can lead students to, to develop uh, you know, some sense of agency and some confidence in themselves. Because they've often been told they can't write. Over and over and over and over again, they've been told, you can't write. After a while, you build up an image of yourself as something you can't write. And that's going to that's gonna destroy you as a writer. Um, so we have to build them back up. Um, and that leads me to a conclusion. I was, some years ago, I was at the University of New Mexico um, doing a, a workshop on writing to learn on these really interesting lower stakes writing assignments. And there was a faculty member in the audience who, you could see the light bulbs just going off. And she'd been teaching there for, you know, I think over 30 years. And she came up later and said, I just, you know, I, this is amazing. I, I've always been so dull, and I just realized that why didn't I give myself permission not to be so dull in my academic writing? And so she started revising her writing assignments, and she started sending them to me by email. Uh, and so one of them was, her goal of the assignment was to critically read an assignment material on the use of land by the, the Dine, the Navajo, and the Spanish settlers and compare the effectiveness of their methods and traditions. Um, and so her assignment was, you know, compare the land use, and, it, and the students were not engaged. And she wasn't particularly engaged, and she kind of dreaded collecting the papers. Uh, and so what she did, so that was, how did the Dina and the Spanish settlers in the Southwest use the same land? Here's the converted version. Imagine that you were one of the sheep living in a Dina controlled flock sometime around 800 and 700 words. Describe what your life is like now and your sheep ancestors' lives. So you're, you're writing for an audience of humans, right? OK, so what happened was, the first thing that happened was the students got extraordinarily engaged in this. That was the first thing. And they came in like wanting to share their, their work. Some students developed sheep dialects, you know, they were like little, <laughs> kind of like Klingon, you know, they were little, little glasses where you have to interpret it and stuff. Um, that was the first thing. The second thing was she couldn't wait to read it. Here's an example. Hey, you, shoo, shoo, you're standing on a human patch of blue drama. Since you're, all you're using is standing on you mind on the inside of it. You can skip through here. It says, we sheep are forced to nibble forbs and woody species. Yuck, those can be hard to digest with all that ligament. 
once in a while we do get tasty alfalfa tree. Um, sometimes I wish I lived in the golden age when life was much better for a sheep. When I was just a wee lamb, my great great grand ram used to tell us the way things used to be. So then, then here's where the content comes in, right? The students actually having to go back and say, how did the lamb get used differently? Well, they couldn't wait to write, they couldn't wait to share it, and she couldn't wait to, to read them. And this is the principle I got from her. If we dread collecting a batch of papers or opening an online folder of student writing, which we often do, right? <laughs> Something is wrong. <laughs> why, do we, why, why are we in this position? I think we can avoid it by doing some things that are really engaging. Uh, and I think consequently we're going to get students engaged, we're going to want to write, we're going to see better content learning, we're going to see, I think, a broader set of experience with writing that might then lead to a much more flexible approach and better transfer of writing into the workplace. Thank you.